This episode is brought to you by Space, supportive parents for anxious childhood emotions. Space is a program for parents with children and adolescents who experience anxiety, OCD, and related problems. Go to neurodiversity.university for details and to register. As an adult, it always starts with self-identification. So whether or not you complete that with an official clinical diagnosis or not is kind of a moot point at a certain time. Well, you're not going to go seek a diagnosis if you haven't already self-identified. Exactly. April is Autism Acceptance Month, and we're presenting a month-long series of perspectives from autism experts and autistic people alike. Today, we are talking with Carolyn Keel. She's the host of the Beyond Six Seconds podcast about the lives of neurodivergent people and was diagnosed as autistic herself as a 40-something adult. This month, we welcome the world to our mission to bring awareness and acceptance to this unique group of people. Episode 166 is straight ahead. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. A reminder that we're releasing another Ask Me Anything episode next week. And even though it may be too late to get your question addressed this time, the only requirement is that you're a member of the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group on Facebook. We'll put a link in the description so you can join up and then watch our feed to submit your question for next time. Our new AMA episode will be released Monday, and I invite you to download it and listen. One more thing before we start. My new book, A Parent's Guide to Gifted Children, a resource for parents and caregivers, will be released on April 11th. Check the show notes for a link and a discount code to pre-order the book. Okay, my conversation with Carolyn Keel is coming right up. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. You know, if you saw a picture of autistic people on a, on a charity website, it would always be children. And in fact, it would always be sort of sad looking children, like looking at the world through a foggy piece of glass or something like that, or, you know, with puzzle pieces missing, etc. Now we understand that that diversity is actually a strength, even in a company. So that the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago ran a front page article, you know, Harvard Business Review is like, when big capitalism gets serious about something, it goes to the Harvard Business Review. And the Harvard Business Review talked about how hiring people with conditions like autism, dyslexia, and ADHD is not just being nice, but it actually helps build company value for stockholders. That's episode 119. Find it wherever you get your podcast. Today, I'm happy to welcome Carolyn Keel to the podcast. Carolyn is the host of the podcast Beyond Six Seconds. So Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Emily, for having me on the show. I'm happy to be here. So one of your areas of passion is about giving neurodivergent people a voice to tell their stories and advocate for their own needs, which obviously I agree with. So tell me a little bit about why you see this as being such an important issue. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a late diagnosis um, where I was diagnosed autistic about a year and a half ago. And I'm in my mid-40s now, so I spent a good part of my life not really understanding much about what autism was and certainly not knowing much about neurodiversity. And, you know, since finding out that I'm autistic, I really wanted to, for myself, learn more about what people's lives were like who are autistic and are other types of neurodivergent. I had really enjoyed meeting a lot of people in the autistic community online leading up to my diagnosis. And it was just kind of happenstance the way that I found out about the autistic community online and the uh disabled community online as well, where I was just looking for guests for my podcast. So I've been podcasting at Beyond Six Seconds for about five years now. And it started out as a general focused interview show where I was just interviewing 
just all kinds of people who had interesting stories, who wanted to talk about their passions and what they really enjoy doing. And it was really just trying to get a nice storytelling type of vibe on the show. And I wound up finding people through social media who were in the disability community and who were also autistic themselves. I had some autistic guests on my show and stayed in touch with them. And just finding out from their experiences that they shared, because many of them were content creators and shared a lot about their experiences, what it was like for them growing up, their internal experiences, and then doing my own reading separately about autism and what it looks like in girls and in women and adults and just learning about what that was really like and comparing it to my own experiences growing up. And it started to make me think like, you know, I, I think you know, there's a definitely a possibility that I might be autistic. And that's why I'm really vibing a lot with people in the community. And I'm just seeing so many similarities. Um, so for me, when I finally decided to go and get a diagnosis, because you know, not everybody goes and, and gets a diagnosis and self-identification um, as autistic is totally valid. For me, it was important for me to find out and uh, and take some clinical tests. So after um, several hours of testing with a clinician, I got the diagnosis and I just wanted to learn more because once as an adult, you get a diagnosis like that, there's not really a whole lot of tangible support that comes afterwards. It's some recommendations you know, some more videos or books to read and things like that, and maybe a little bit more insight about yourself. So I just wanted to learn about other people's stories. And I was totally fascinated by um, just how different everybody's stories are, but at the same time, a lot of commonalities that I saw as well. And in terms of giving neurodivergent people a voice, I, I don't know that my show necessarily gives neurodivergent people a voice because I they, they already have voices. Um, even I've interviewed some non-speaking autistic people on the show, and they have quite a lot of things to say themselves as well when we get together. Um, but I can help amplify and share their voices and share their stories, our stories, and um, you know, just get them out to wider audience. Because if I didn't know what the neurodivergent adult experience is, then I'm sure most people in the world don't know about it as well. And I like that point. I mean, I think we say using the giving them a voice as kind of a turn of phrase, but you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. It's about the amplification and the and the recognition that sometimes unfortunately gets overlooked too often in our society. And so finding that way to make sure that we are listening a little bit better to neurodivergent people is really important. Absolutely. One thing that I found as I have been learning throughout my life about neurodiversity and um, autism and ADHD is that a lot of it comes from people who aren't neurodivergent themselves. So it comes from experts, people who have studied it, um, parents sometimes who will talk about their children and uh, other people who maybe work with autistic people or or other people. And it, it's different because so much, at least of autism and probably a lot of other neurodiversity as well, I found is an internal experience. So people on the outside can only really look at you from the outside and talk about your behavior and how they interpret what you're doing. But unless you talk to people who are neurodivergent, you don't understand what it's like in their own internal experience, like sensory overload or just the way that they think and process information. So that's what I'm really trying to elevate on the show as well. Your own experience is one I think that's very similar to a lot of adults today who are being diagnosed as neurodivergent um, as an adult, but they've survived through their childhood yeah. without that recognition or that support that might have come along with the diagnosis. And I think, like you mentioned, it's a lot different now. Mm -hmm. The supports maybe even that would have been beneficial weren't available um, but when you look back on your childhood, what was it really like and how do you think it would have been different if you'd been diagnosed? You know, I've thought about this since getting the diagnosis and it's so hard to go back and say definitively that it would have been totally beneficial or that it would have been detrimental because I have to put it in the historical context of when I grew up, which was in the 1980s, 1990s. and how autism was viewed at the time. So first of all, I, there's no way I would have gotten the diagnosis the way that it was defined right. uh, at a young age, at the age that a lot of kids are being diagnosed now. So that would have been like the late 70s and just 
I don't even know how autism was described in the in the DSM <laughs> at that time, but um, I'm, I'm sure it, it wouldn't have even been on anyone's radar the way that it was defined at that time. Yeah. And I don't know what kind of supports there were um, for autism at that point. So I think that's part of the reason why a lot of us of a certain age have gone uh, unidentified for so long. It, it would help put some things in context about my own internal experiences. And I think I maybe growing up would have been a lot kinder to myself or just more aware of you know, why I reacted to things in certain ways. So for example, I'm like a very sensitive person. And I don't just mean emotionally. I mean, literally, like my senses are are heightened in a lot of ways, especially like my hearing. Um, you know, my, my, my vision's kind of getting bad with age, but at a certain point, my vision was as well. Um, you know, certain smells, things like that. So and, and as well as the emotional experience, I, I often feel like I can almost visualize my like my nervous system or my nerves like extending, you know, a couple inches outside of my body. Like that's how, that's sort of like my internal feeling of how I go through the world. And, you know, back then there was no real name for it. It was like, well, you're just like oversensitive. You, you know, kind of react to things in ways that, you know, the whole like grow a thick skin or, or toughen up and things like that, which, you know, I guess we, we all do with certain age, but it, I was never really sure how to do that. Like I got a lot of that advice. I'm like, I don't understand how people do this because everything is just so painful. Mm -hmm. So I, if I had understood that, well, no, you're autistic and a lot of autistic people have heightened sensitivity or, or easily get into sensory overload or sometimes will become non-speaking if they're totally overwhelmed or in like a freeze response. I think that would have helped me feel like like less of a a bad person. I hate to say that language, but I mean, sometimes that's kind of how I felt was like, why can't I function like everybody else? Why is this part of things so hard for me? Especially since so many things were relatively, quote unquote, came easily to me. I was actually in gifted programs starting in fourth grade, you know, through all of my grammar and high school years. I did really well academically, you know, the, the structure of school and that rhythm of, you know, the structure of the classes and homework worked really well for me. It doesn't work so well for a lot of autistic people, but that type of structure um, I really thrived on. And, um, I, you know, I, at the same time, I was, I'm was i hyperlexic. So I started school, I think I was four years old because I'm, I'm born later in the year. So I'm younger one in the class. I already knew how to read when I got to school. I have no idea how I learned how to read. I have no memory of anyone teaching me. I think my parents say I just watched Sesame Street and that's how I learned to read. And reflecting back, I'm like, I don't know that's how people learn to read. <laughs> people have to sit and look at books and people teach them things. It's odd. But um, but again, hy hyperlexia, which is that like reading at a very early age and that obsession with words um, is highly correlated with autism. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it would have helped. I mean, it would have helped me to understand that there was something that there was a label for this thing that I was feeling. I don't know that I would have gotten any supports for that really at that time. Mm -hmm. But um, as an adult, it's helpful to to know it now. It's interesting that you mentioned hyperlexia. I think a lot of people aren't really aware of that or what that is. Yeah. As a parent, though, so my oldest um, at 18 months was pointing out letters and identifying them wow. without us ever having really taught him how to do that. And he was reading by three and all of these different things. And it is interesting, though, like that systematic learning that goes along with that and like the recognition and the problem solving that goes along with that. I think it makes sense why that might be a strength for a lot of autistic individuals. Mm -hmm. But as a parent, a little odd to see because <laughs> you mentioned that, you you know, maybe you were watching Sesame Street. I know exactly what our son was doing. He had a have you ever seen those little caterpillar toys that have like all the legs I don't know what is caterpillar centipede, but each little leg has a little letter and you can press the letter and it identifies like it just it's like a little toy. Oh, OK. I think I've seen those. Yes. And so he had one of those and it was like he liked that little toy and that helped him learn that. But, <laughs> you know, I think there are a lot of things that people don't realize can be not necessarily autistic traits, but might be autistic traits. Are there any others like that that you feel like maybe are unrecognized? You know, some of those more subtle signs that that people don't always identify? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. 
Um, anything I say here obviously does not apply to every single autistic person. Of course. But going with the hyperlexia, I think part of that is having an advanced vocabulary early mm -hmm. in your years. So I don't know that I had a, a super advanced vocabulary. I like it. You know, I was very good at learning words and remembering them. And now I, I tend to use big words, but I don't notice it as much because a lot of my friends use big words. So it's like, OK, this is just how we talk. So um, but a lot of autistic people as children will use words that are much more advanced for their age. So, again, not all autistic people are um, speak that way, but um, a lot of us really do enjoy words and we'll learn a lot of quote unquote more advanced words compared to our ages. Some of these might be more specific, but I think um I think a lot of people might be familiar with this one, but a lot of um you know, quote unquote being a picky eater, mm -hmm. which is how I describe it for more neurotypical kids who, you know, a lot of kids just don't like to try different types of foods when they're young. Um because I think a lot of kids in general may have a sensitive palate that kind of eases up as time goes on. And my diet, I really only ate like about five different things growing up for the longest time. But again, my mom's like, well, they're they're relatively healthy things. So I guess that's fine. And I turned out okay. <laughs> my diet did expand um, much further when I was an adult. But some kids will have a condition where literally it's not, it's not that they don't like the food or that it tastes yucky and that's why they don't eat it. For some autistic kids, it's literally painful to eat it. Like the texture, it's not just like, oh, this is chewy. I don't like it. It's like, this tastes like shards of glass or like that's how painful it is for some autistic kids. So I think a lot of times people think, oh, they're just a picky eater. You know, they have to learn how to eat and we have to force them to eat. I mean, I hope people aren't really doing that anymore. Um, but just understanding that that sensory experience for some autistic children can be a lot more intense than just they're picky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's we don't we don't keep our safe foods, as we say, for our entire lives or all of them. Actually, I still eat a lot of the same foods that I ate when I was younger. But um, it, it is true that your kid's diet will expand over time. So, yeah. you know, a lot of times we will call things safe foods where it's something predictable. It could be, you know, for some people it's like, um, you know, like crackers or um, something that's consistent every single time. Um, for other people, it's more of like a comfort type of food. So if you're young and you grew up, um, you know, I have one autistic friend who eats like, you know, spicy rice and beans because she's Puerto Rican and that was her safe food as a kid and that she still eats that when she is having trouble eating other things. That's her comfort food. So Yeah. There's a lot of those little nuanced things that um, I think sometimes get overlooked. Yeah. More in a minute. If your child deals with anxiety or OCD, it's likely you've tried any number of strategies to help them. But if you're still struggling, we're launching a new program that may be just what you've been looking for. It's called SPACE, Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions. It's a parent-based program that helps parents help their kids with anxiety, obsessive compulsive thoughts, and other related problems. SPACE was developed by Dr. Ellie Leibowitz at the Yale Child Study Center. SPACE really is teaching the parent how to be supportive and teaching the parent how to recognize and reduce their accommodations. And clinical trial research from multiple studies indicates that it's a very efficacious way of treating anxiety and OCD. And so uh, I think that can be a very helpful resource for, for a lot of families. This podcast parent organization, the Neurodiversity Alliance, has agreed to be a space-trained provider, and we are now taking registrations for a limited number of spots that are available. Follow the link in the show notes or go to neurodiversity.university and click the link. It's a proven tool to help parents help their kids. You mentioned that it was about a year and a half ago that you started to seek your diagnosis. And there are just a lot of barriers to getting a diagnosis of autism at any age, but especially in today's world as an adult, we are professionals don't always know what autism looks like in adults. Um, there can be a lot of dismissal of concerns. Did you face any hurdles like that when you started seeking your diagnosis or was that process pretty smooth for you? It was pretty smooth for me, but that's mainly because I knew that there were hurdles and I did a lot of research up front to make sure that I found a diagnostician that was informed about what autism looks like 
one in adults to in women and had experience diagnosing adults and women and who was also somewhat connected to the autistic community. Like she wasn't autistic herself, but she listens to autistic people on social media. So has sort of a more rounded view of what autism looks like in adults. Um, I think part of the challenge, well, there's, there's a lot of challenge. One is cost because it can be expensive. It's often not covered by insurance for adults. And, um, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to find one that was affordable for me, who's qualified to do the diagnosis in your state, like um, in the United States. So practitioners a lot of times are licensed to practice in a specific state. So I can't just go necessarily to anyone in any of the 50 states and just pick someone who I think is the best. I have to work with someone who's either in the state I'm in or has an agreement to work with the state that I live in. So that's another complication. I was lucky. I pre-interviewed the person and just asked them what their technique was like, what types of tests they use, because there's all different types of tests and some work better for kids and, and judging things versus adults. Uh, I've talked to other guests and other acquaintances and who have just had kind of nightmarish experiences trying to get an adult autism diagnosis. Like the clinician will have them like playing with blocks and things like and making stories, which is the test you give to like a young child in preschool. You don't give it to an adult. It's like, I don't need an IQ test. This has nothing to do with anything. And some practitioners really haven't updated their views of autism and may be looking at you and saying like, well, you can make eye contact and you're talking to me right now, so you're clearly not autistic. So it, it's it's tough. I, I I got lucky to find someone after doing a lot of research, but um, a lot of people I've talked with online and in person have had a challenging time, yeah. which is why so many autistic people don't even bother getting diagnosed once they're adults, because, you know, a lot of times there's not a whole lot of support. So unless you need the diagnosis for some reason that can help you, but um, otherwise... That's why we say self-diagnosis is valid or self-identification is valid because, because as an adult, it always starts with self-identification. So whether or not you complete that with an official clinical diagnosis or not um, is kind of a moot point at a certain at a certain time. Well, you're not going to go seek a diagnosis if you haven't already self-identified. Exactly. You made the point that some adults feel like it may not really be worthwhile to go through what can be an arduous process right? because it may not really change a whole lot for them, um, which actually brings me to the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. I feel like schools and businesses are working to become more inclusive environments for neurodivergent people, but we have a long way to go. I'm curious about what some of your ideas are about some of the foundational things, the institution, society could put into place in order to be successful in accommodating neurodivergent kids and adults? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I know there is a growing body of work around neurodiversity at work and specific neurodiversity programs. And sometimes it's recognized as part of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at corporations. And I think that's really great progress. I think there's still a long way to go. Um, with really understanding neurodiversity at work, because I feel like a lot of the programs I read about will label themselves around neurodiversity, but it's really just how do we recruit autistic adults and put them in very specific types of jobs, like specific, like computer programming, or sometimes it's like repetitive types of jobs, which, you know, some autistic people like, but we have a diverse bunch of interests. Like I'm very creative. I'm a musician. I know autistic people who are artists and journalists and writers. And so that only really addresses a very narrow piece. Because I'm trying to think of practically without every company putting together their own neurodiversity program. I don't know that's even needed for every single company. I think just creating an inclusive environment in your place of employment. And if you're a people leader, you really have a lot of power over the, the tone of what the workplace is like. I think creating those inclusive environments in the workplace really are helpful, um, not just for neurodivergent people, but for anyone who is, you know, has an identity that tends to be marginalized in society, you know, for, for any type of reason. Yeah. You know, with leadership, the, the tone is really set at the top in terms of building that inclusive environment. Because like, you know, 
what, what do we mean by that? So there's, you know, people putting out, writing out the values and stating like, this is what the company stands for. But it's really like the individual managers, like the middle management managers who have those teams of people who really have the most influence, you know, how people are treated at work. And they can really make or break an inclusion strategy. And I think the easiest thing, if you're a people manager and you have employees, whether or not they're neurodivergent, if they're sharing something with you of a challenge that they're having at work is one is to really listen to what they're saying and to believe them. If they're asking for an accommodation and they may not use those words like I need an accommodation for this. Like, for example, I've talked with a lot of people on my show who want to wear headphones because they work in a noisy environment. Like they're not even asking to change the environment. Like, can I just wear headphones so that I can focus on my work? And, and, and managers have told them, no, you can't because it, for whatever, honestly, ridiculous reason, like it looks bad, um, customers will see you and they'll think that it's off-putting or no, because you won't hear us. Or they just say blanket, no, and you don't need that. And something like that is just such a simple thing to tweak. Yeah. And you can try it. You can see if, if it has a negative effect on the person's performance, but um, there's a really good chance it probably won't. A lot of people will kind of know if they're asking that specifically, they'll know what they need and um, they shouldn't have to fight and convince someone. And those sort of things work with people who are neurodivergent or neurotypical. I mean, one of the challenges is that a lot of neurodivergent people don't know that they're neurodivergent. So they're not going to tell you because they, one, may not feel safe saying that. And two, they may honestly may not even know that they are. Right. I would say, you know, don't ask someone to like, put together a case for why they need something or have proof of disability or anything like that, you know, try it out. Say like, you know, let's, let's try headphones and see how that works with your focus and see if we get like what kind of feedback we get from people, if, if anything, or if it impacts the work that you do or the work relationships you have. And, um, and if it doesn't, then yeah, why not? Then continue on um, doing that. As much as a lot of these programs focus on recruiting neurodivergent people, You've already got neurodivergent people working in your company, and uh, you've got individual contributors, you've got managers and leaders, and, uh, you know, just start taking care and making that inclusive environment for the people who are already there or that you will bring into your company in the future. You've shared a few things that you've heard from guests on your podcast, but I'm sure you've heard just many amazing stories from the neurodivergent people that you talk with. What are some of the the takeaways or the lessons that have been the most meaningful to you? Yeah, it's something that I've been thinking about over the past year or so, all the conversations that I've had so far with my guests. Uh, a couple things. One is that, you know, while neurodivergent people have a lot of things in common, um, so like a lot of autistic people have things in common with each other, people with ADHD, people with Tourette syndrome um, have things in common with each other but we don't experience them all the same way. So like with autism around sensory sensitivities, some of us have very heightened sensitivities um, and others have less, like actually hyposensitivity, so less sensitivity to things. And it may vary from day to day or situation to situation for the same person. But that's interesting when people say that autism is a spectrum that's really how it manifests is that you've got different traits and some are, you know, very high on the chart. Some may be very low. We often have what's called spiky profiles, which means that we have like some very, very strong strengths or heightened um, abilities or behaviors or thoughts. And then others that are more sort of lower on the scale. And a lot of times, or actually I would say all the time, our experience of our own neurodivergence is impacted by our other identities. So our gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, other disabilities we may have at the same time, um, which is why on my show, I really try to share stories of people who come from all different backgrounds. So my experience as an autistic white woman um, is not going to be the same as an autistic black man, even if we're the same age and maybe live in the same neighborhood, um, just because you can't, it's very hard to separate out all of the intersectionality of all the different identities. So um, it's really important to share stories from people of all different backgrounds. Yeah. Another thing I learned is that a lot of times growing up, you have the concept of labeling. And a lot of times labeling 
gets a really bad rap. Like, you know, people say like, don't label yourself or don't label other people because you're putting limits on yourself. And, and especially with autism, I think a lot of people are still kind of scared of that word. And they're like, why would you want to label yourself as autistic? You're just a human being and blah, blah. And, and sure. Okay. But, um, uh, I learned that not all labels are bad. And in, in fact, getting a label, whether it's a diagnosis or a self-identification, can just be really good because it means now you know what this is, your experience is. There are people in common with you who you can now go find, probably online or out in your community, and share similar experiences. And you can sometimes get the support that you need because you have a label for what this is. And and the thing is, I always say is, you know, I know sometimes people are scared of labels like, um, like autistic, but, um, but the thing is, you're gonna, you're gonna get labels that you don't want, even if you don't get that one. So the labels I got were like, you know, too sensitive, like too shy too you know, like a lot of things that really are, in some ways, part of my autism. Um, so you know, people are going to give you labels anyway. So it's very empowering to understand what your own label is. Mm -hmm. And then I think the last thing I want to say is that I don't, I'm not a parent myself. So I really try to shy away from giving any kind of parenting advice because I do not have that experience. I have no expertise in that area. But one thing I've learned from my guests who have shared their stories, especially ones that were diagnosed in childhood, but didn't find out until many years later that they had a diagnosis of autism is, um, it, you know, if your child is diagnosed with autism, um, I recommend not keeping that from them. Um, I understand that it's, it's probably really, really hard to tell a young kid, like, what autism is. And, um, and I know you're probably a lot of people are scared of, of upsetting them or making them discouraged in life. Or, but um, I, I can tell you some of the stories that I've heard that are told on my show of people um, getting the diagnosis and then like literally everyone else knows, everyone in the school knows that you're autistic, your family knows you're autistic, everyone except you knows that you're autistic and then it then the news comes out in some way that's really not planned or not uh, not really that beneficial and probably not the way that anyone wants to learn that they're autistic. So yeah. um, I know it's really hard to talk about this with young kids, but um, I would urge you if, if you're a parent, if you have a young autistic child, uh, please find a way to to tell them what autism is and in an age appropriate discussion way so that uh that they can find their people they can embrace their label and it will help them growing up understand what they're feeling and and how to advocate for themselves and uh you know just how to process life and find other people to connect with yeah i agree with all of those things so carolyn as as we wrap up our conversation the last question i want to ask is this if you were able to give a message to your younger self when you were, say, elementary school, middle school, I don't know, whatever age you feel like you maybe most needed to hear something about the experiences that you were having, what's the message that you would want to send back to that younger version of yourself? I think I would probably tell myself to just be a lot kinder to myself about the limitations that I had and to remind myself that, you know, like <laughs> the situation you're in now is not forever. Like I think a lot of times in school, especially as a kid, your whole life is spent in school until it's not. So that becomes your whole world. So I know for me as a gifted child, my grades were like critically important and like the be all and end all and, you know, getting a a bad grade, which would be like a B, which is not a bad grade. But getting something outside of my expectations would have devastated me and just meant, you know, oh my gosh, what's my future going to look like? None of that stuff really matters. Like, yeah, it has influences, you know, big trends will influence parts of your life, but it's not going to dictate how your life is going to go. You're going to wind up in other environments that will need different types of strengths and skills um, that you need to develop or that you already have that you're not using in school. You'll face challenges that you won't know how to how you got through them, but somehow you'll you'll cope and get through them and you'll learn from them and you know you'll you'll meet people from outside your community so who have all different experiences. You'll make all different kinds of friends over the years. I think just reminding myself that 
the experience that I'm having at that time is not forever and that things change and um, good things happen, bad things happen, but that, um, you know, the life that you have now is not, um, is not going to dictate exactly the rest of your entire life, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Carolyn Keel, host of the podcast Beyond Six Seconds. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. People need the opportunity to be heard. Neurodivergent people need space to tell their stories. It's through listening to their stories that we give people permission to unmask and be their authentic selves. It's through these stories that we learn how we can make our world a better place. And it's through these stories that we're able to reflect to become better parents, educators, therapists, and even just the best version of ourselves. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. This episode has been brought to you by SPACE, Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions. It's a program for parents with children and adolescents who experience anxiety, OCD, and related problems. Go to the show notes for details and a link. Our thanks to Carolyn Keel. You can find information about her and her work on the episode page at neurodiversitypodcast.com and in the show notes. Hey, that website is also where you can find our A Little Weird is Good podcast t-shirt. Just click on the merchandise link at the top of the page. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and social media guru is Krista Brown. I'm the show's executive producer, Dave Morris. And for all of us here, thank you for listening during Autism Acceptance Month. We'll see you next time. I'm not gonna lose myself. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.